how do you qualify as a whistleblower? The definition is a person who informs on a person or an organization that is engaged in illicit activity. People feel from their conscience they need to come forward. So there are a lot of laws that are put in place to keep secrets. Most of these unacknowledged programs are illegal by their very definition. So those who've been ordered to keep silent are breaking the law. They're not uh, uh, upholding the law. Now in most cases for a whistleblower, you're gonna need documentation, supporting physical evidence, and testimony. Testimony is, you can enter testimony as evidence in a court of law. So testimony has to be backed up with supporting evidence and the proper documentation, which is hard to obtain with civilian assets, but military assets, you have their processing papers, their DD-214. Compartmentalization it has been used to a major degree to prevent people within the same organization from having access to the same information. There can be, usually, Everyone is told they're at the top of the totem pole with uh, intelligence. And each one of these people, they believe it so strongly, if you come with information that's above what they have been told they are, they will disbelieve it because their egos believe that they have the highest information in the land. And of course, testimony, because the way compartmentalization works, you can be shown very sensitive papers, photos, videos, but it's done in what is called a skiff room. It is a room that is, um, it blocks all signals from technology from coming in and the information cannot leave that skiff room. So therefore it is impossible for these documents to make it out to the public. So how does my story begin? How many people here have watched Cosmic Disclosure? Okay, well, uh, if you go to blueavians.com, you can watch some free episodes for those who have not seen it, and uh, it is translated into Spanish. I used to think that my involvement in the programs began just from some testing that I did, and I popped up um, on their radar, but it turns out that my family is a part of a multi-generational experiment that began in World War II. My uh, grandfather was a Seventh-day Adventist, which is a, um, a nonviolent, very nonviolent uh, sect of Christianity. And um, he was drafted into the military, but because of his religious beliefs, they gave him a choice to join a program to where he wouldn't have to engage in combat. And that program was similar, but not Project White Coat. It was very similar. They would inject them with viruses and bacteria that were commonly found on the battlefield, and then they would develop treatments for it. That was the cover story. What was actually occurring is that in 1945, before we had supposedly discovered DNA, they were already manipulating DNA using viruses as a delivery system. And I am a product of that experiment. Growing up, it was never a big secret that my grandfather was a part of an experiment. Um, we were told never, never ask him about it. He was, he was very upset. He was a very proud, vain man. And when he was given the injections, he became so ill that um, they, they were, when, while they were taking care of him, they put a bunch of pillows behind his back and his back fused in a curved manner. And uh, he was like this um, ever, ever since I was born. That's, that's how I knew him. And he, he was a very proud man. Recently, um, Dr. Sala and um, some of his associates submitted a Freedom of Information Act. I was told not to say FOIA because it might get a... <laughs> An interesting uh, reaction from the Spanish speakers. <laughs> but the Freedom of Information Act, it 
it didn't uh, give us the information we wanted, and the medical information about my grandfather only went back to, I believe, 1984. So there was a huge gap. Now, of course, America has a huge history of uh, unsuspecting tests on its citizens and soldiers. The Tagiski uh, airmen, they were giving them syphilis on purpose. And finally, there was an apology, but, uh, you know, the, I mean, this just goes to show the level of governments, and it's not just the American government, that um, you'd think they would test on an in enemy population, but they test on their own population. Now, I was brought into the MyLab program, which stands for Military Abduction, and uh, this is a program that identifies children that have certain gifts, and then usually these people identify as starseeds, as I'm sure all of you do. What the military's goal was, was to find these starseeds before they engaged in their mission and to turn them to the dark side, so to speak, and to use them as a tool. And this is done at a, at a level that's very sickening. And of course, they use both civilian and military assets. They mostly use military assets in the 20 and back programs. Rarely do they use civilians. Yeah, there's a picture of me. At, I think I was seven there. So they develop standardized testing to be able to identify uh, a number of different things that they're looking for for the programs. One of them was they were looking for intuitive empaths to help them interface with non-humans. Usually they already had a good idea who these empaths were because they track every alien abduction that occurs. Almost every abduction that occurs, the military comes in, re-abducts them, goes through, they, they do a debriefing with them, usually under chemi chemical means, pharmaceuticals. Then they give them more screen memories, which really confuses them after they've already had that done by the non-terrestrials. And then they return them back to, um, back home. They just, they, they gather intelligence after they're abducted. And this is done on a wide scale in almost every country. Now, in the beginning, they used a lot of children, a lot of military assets in these programs. But later on in the most recent years, they've started using clones. They, were, they, they grow clones, and then they become programmed life forms. They are not as uh, efficient as an Earth-grown human, though. Efficient in doing these different uh, jobs, like interfacing with aliens. They don't have the experiences that we have on Earth to uh, add to the communication, which is very important. About an hour from where I grew up, there was a base called Carswell Air Force Base. It was a, um, I think it was the seventh bomber wing. Now, after they identified me in school as being an asset, they found a way to pull me out of normal classes into different classes. Sometimes I would be in classes with extremely gifted people, and sometimes I'd be in classes with people that were wearing diapers. I mean, they, they were people that uh, were underdeveloped, but they just wanted me out of the mainstream curriculum so that they could remove me from school at any point. Under Carswell Air Force Base, for, um, during, of course, the Cold War, everyone thought nuclear war was going to happen. They built a huge underground facility. That underground facility connects to the underground uh, magnetic train system, the maglev system. And recently, there are two different people. I've described where I went in, uh, which I went in the back gate. I, I crossed two airstrips, went through another checkpoint, and then drove into a large motor pool hangar that was kind of like an airplane hangar with the doors opened. And I would go in, and there would be windows on the second floor overlooking where all the vehicles park. Their program is to basically like Noah's Ark, keep uh, the human genome safe from extinction 
by keeping part of it underground and part of the human race on other planets. So we don't have all of our eggs in one basket, as I say, in Texas anyway. So they do, there's a lot of cloning that goes on that's been going on for a long time. Anything that is unethical on the surface, surface to do research-wise is either going on in Antarctica in their R&D bases or below ground. A major area is in Mexico, the zone of silence. Uh, they have, originally they called it an NBC facility, uh, nuclear biological chemical development, but they do quite a lot of uh, cloning there and uh, very disturbing experiments. This is, you've probably seen this on the internet, this is very old and uh, somewhat accurate of the, the maglev or magnetic trains that go underground, they go to all these different bases and it shows it going off to uh, down to Central and South America, but I haven't seen any maps that show the details of South America. That goes through a lot, a lot through Brazil, Argentina. So a lot of the training that we had when we were taken underground, we were interfacing with technologies that there would be like plates that you put your hand on or two little protrusions in a chair that connect to, you know, the dimples in the back of your shoulders? That's an area where a lot of nerves crisscross. And that is a place to where if they have this node, this metal node, positive, negative, going that you lay back against, and also plates that you can put your hands on, it is a neurological interface to technology. The things you see out of your eyes you completely believe, you hear, you smell, you taste. They can manipulate all of that. You, one of the major tests is for you to be able to determine when you've been put into some sort of a virtual reality simulation. They're so real, it's very difficult. And of course, at the, back then, at the end of every session, you were chemically blank slated, which means mind erased and given screen memories. If you, were, if you left school, your memories would be that you went to a natural uh, history museum and, and looked at dinosaur bones, when in actuality, you had gone underground and had been subjected to all kinds of terrible experiments. You come home and you have all this trauma from what, seeing dinosaur bones, you know? So it was hard to explain the trauma that we would have and the bad dreams. We usually trained in small cells and between the ages of six and 10, Normally, we were trained at night. We were picked up and we were brought to a mall, an indoor mall where you normally go shopping. It would be shut down and there would be reptilians there. There would be different uh, groups there that would be observing the training that would go on. And different cells of children would be pitted against each other in these competitions. So they had to start somewhere with the children. So they started with a lot of the basic training. We, we learned traditional firearms, field stripping of weapons, blindfolded by touch. We learned hand-to-hand um, -hand combat, which was something I was already learning from my grandfather. Wayfinding, you know, um, reading maps and being able to determine where you are and how to get to where you want to be. Calculating objects at a distance for, um, you know, kind of like snipers do, you know, the rule of thumb type of, to tell how far away a human is. And of course, communication protocols for, um, for radio. Now, you cannot just introduce a person to a non-terrestrial without some sort of acclimation or preparation. In the beginning, we would the virtual reality scenarios I was mentioning, we would go in, we would walk into a room and there would be like card tables, like you know you play cards at, with military and scientific people sitting around them. And then you would go into your virtual reality training and then when you would come out and as they were walking you back through where you came, you would look over at the table and there would be a great alien sitting there. And that, that was their, First little step, they would show, usually they will show you photos uh, to kind of get you 
your mind ready for it, and then they introduce you to these beings in that kind of a manner. They don't want it to be too much of a shock. And if you ask any questions like, what was that? All right, they would just tell you, you didn't have a need to know. So this helped deprogram the fight or flight response that all of us have. Um, it, it can be quite the adrenaline release when uh, you're in front of one of these beings, especially as psychic as some of them are. They're very, some of them are very invasive. And of course, there were hybrid children that were present also during our training. And I have a few disturbing stories about my interactions with them that I, I, I do not make public. So once they develop your, you have the in, intuitive empath abilities, they have a cocktail of chemicals that can enhance those abilities. And when you come off of the chemicals, it is almost like going blind. You lose all of these uh, extra senses. All of your senses are enhanced. But when you're taken off the medication, it's like going blind and deaf to a certain degree. And of course, much of, uh, they believe all evolution occurs through trauma. So much of the training is extremely traumatic, very traumatic. They would put us in sensory deprivation chambers for hours, or you know, you, you lose all sense of time. It seemed like hours. And even in these sensory deprivation chambers, at times they would use virtual reality as well. And you, the out-of-body experiences that, that we had were just epic. Now, a lot of people have heard of the MK Ultra programs, and they associate any type of program like the one that I've been in as being MK Ultra, mind controlled, you know, German mind control. But there are a lot of ultra programs, and very most of them use the mind control. Um, tactics that they learned in MK Ultra, but these other programs have completely other agendas and are only related to MK Ultra by name, the Ultra part. Now, every single person in this room, including myself, is actively under mind control. We have all types of mind control, socially programmed, religious programmed, genetically programmed, and uh, technology that's interfering with our consciousness. Well, first of all, one of the number one symptoms that children and young uh, teens had, they, a lot of them would have a very nice life at home, a very good home life with their family, but they had unexplained post-traumatic stress disorder. They couldn't explain it. Well, on one level, of course, our subconscious level, we recall all of the trauma-based programming that occurred, but consciously, there's no memory of it. So there's a conflict between, between the conscious and the subconscious that creates all of the symptoms of PTSD. I was actually 15 here, I think, but... Um, at the age of 13 is when we reached the apex of the training. That's when they started giving us the injections. And uh, the, uh, the full dose, when they built up to the full dose, it, uh, the jump in your abilities was so dramatic that a lot of people began to get kind of Christ complexes. Felt like they were something, you know, bigger or better than everyone else. Um, so that, you know, that, that was a problem. There were a lot of people that um, yeah, really began to think that they were here to save the, the planet. I was brought to a crystal cavern, much like the one they found in Mexico. We were brought there in a small submarine that went through an underground river. And the underground river, at a certain point, it diverted into this further area we traveled under, and then we popped out into an area to where there were no crystals, it was a cavern, but we were brought back by the people who were stationed there 
into this um, room to where we prepared. We, we were put in environmental protective suits. Uh, we had all of these uh, different devices on us monitoring our uh, telemetry, you know, heart, brain, neurology. And um, recently, when I was recounting the story, I recalled a blocked memory of a tall white being being in the middle of all of the children that were in a circle. These crystals, they told us, were alive. They were beings. They had a life force. They wanted us to interface with them and to gather information, but we were told, do not touch them. If you touch them, you can harm the crystal, or, and the crystal could harm us. And when we started to interface with them, an aura of light started to build around the crystals, and, and the crystals were huge, even bigger than, wider than these. It's very hot, 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, at, um, USB device, human, as children, we were used like a USB device. We went in, we interfaced with the crystals, we gathered all of this information, and then we were debriefed chemically, where they removed all the information, just like we were a common memory stick, and then blank slated us, and then they, that's how they gathered their intelligence. When I was around 13 years old, and I had reached a certain level of ability to interface with non-terrestrials, they brought me and two other children to a federation meeting. This is a very close representation to what that base looked like. It was in the middle of a temporal anomaly outside of Jupiter. You had to enter in and exit the exact same way or you would get stuck. You could see no stars. You would fly, you'd leave a star field, you would enter this anomaly, and it was pitch black. And there were over 60 different non-terrestrial groups that met in a large portion. It was much like the UN, very much. There would be one to three ETs sitting in, a, in seats, and then there was a horseshoe-type rail in front of them and then they would have uh, psychic support, intuitive impasse of their own who would sit there and monitor the room looking for any signs of deception or danger. And when we were sitting there, they did not want us focusing on what was going on. They would give us kind of like iPads, a smart glass pad that you neurologically interfaced with to have us preoccupy our minds while we were doing the intuitive work. And there was no visible technology in these places. It was all consciousness-based, very advanced technology. Now, attendees included the Nordic races, the greys, and the, most of the greys are a programmed life form. Um, you have positive, negative, and indifferent groups that all use these programmed life forms that we call the greys. They were developed by an insectoid race way before humans were even on the planet. And it's become like a, a standard hardware for different beings to use, a biological machine. Now, the reason they had three intuitive impasse was that if one picked up on a um, possible issue, it, they needed the two others to triangulate, to verify that it was a threat because you would get a lot of false positives at times based on your own emotions of being in a situation. And of course, our different belief systems played into and filtered the information that was coming through, so it was always good to have three different perspectives. Uh, normally, the three people would not be from the same culture or speak the same languages, and it helped them get a better triangulation. Now, according, a lot of the information, and one of the biggest problems we have in science is that they focus on the numbers and the tangible, and they do not consider the esoteric, like we do. During World War II, the Germans did not have that problem. 
they married science and the esoteric, and the results were phenomenal. In, in the early 30s, they were flying around in anti-gravity devices. All of, in, from the glass pads, all of these different esoteric negative groups had a different belief system or religion about what was to occur in what we're calling the ascension. And they had completely differing ideas on consciousness and how it was developing. So in these negative Illuminati groups, there's not a consensus on their belief systems. There are various belief systems, some very pragmatic, very scientific, some very esoteric, and very just even more out there than people call us. Now, there was an ancient builder race that was here two billion years ago in our solar system. And our local star cluster of 52 stars, they had developed out all of those star systems and put a protective grid around it to keep out what we've referred to as the genetic farmer races that come in and start doing all of these different experiments. And they kept the local 52 stars very safe for many, many, many millennia, even over a billion years. But the pre-Adamites on Mars and Tiamat had a civil war and they utilized the technology of this protective grid against each other and they accidentally brought down the entire grid. And when they did that, all of these genetic farmer races that had really wanted to come in and get this fresh genetic stock, just they moved in and, and took over. This is our local star cluster. You'll see Sol, the sun, right there in the middle. A very coveted position. Just outside of our solar system is what they call a supergate. We've heard portals described here, and those are point-to-point -point transfers. A supergate can transfer you to any planet within this galaxy and to with any galaxy. They're all connected with an electromagnetic filament that we call uh, the cosmic web. Now, when these genetic farmer groups moved in, they started over 22 different genetic experiments here. And these experiments are not just genetic. They're about ascension. And all of them have different agendas for ascension, all of these different groups. They compete, these programs compete. And they are a spiritual and genetic ascension program. A lot of these groups, they've brought us religions, different belief systems to help our consciousness expand. And they will tinker with our genetics to cause us to advance genetically. And then this vessel is better able to support the consciousness that they're trying to expand. So these two go together. 65 million years ago, according to the reptilians, this planet was theirs. They believed it was theirs. They had an experiment, a genetic experiment. There's just not, a, not only a mammalian experiment going out there on different stars. There are insectoid experiments. There are uh, reptilian, there are, you name it. And the reptilians supposedly had three races of humanoids here on Earth that were destroyed in the cleansing, uh, genetic cleansing that occurred by these human, more human-like ET races that came in. They cleaned the Earth of the uh, reptilian experiment and started a mammalian experiment, which is highly against um, uh, cosmic law on one degree, but um, they began to do this because the reptilian experiments were just uh, going uh, crazy. There were just too many of them. The reptilians often discuss that there were three lost races. Interestingly enough, on Gaia TV, they discovered this three-fingered mummy in Nazca. Have you all heard of that? Well, I've seen some of the information on the genetic 
uh, test results. Now, if we were to find an ET body and test it, would any of you be surprised that 97% of that DNA matches ours? It's not because they're from here, it's because we're from there. We've been genetically engineered and spliced with all of these different beings' DNA as a part of this experiment. Now, all of you have heard about the Hopi stories, about how the ant people took humans down into inner earth during the last cataclysm and then brought them back out afterwards. Well, apparently the reptilians did the same thing. They removed certain species from the surface and brought them underground. They developed into the raptor race, and there are uh, some of them that are like little dogs. There, there are many different types of species of them. And they're primarily in South and Central America. They are uh, some, they, they have on the, on the back of their heads, they have a plume of colorful feathers. And they're very, they're not really, they're, they're kind of a mix between reptilians and birds. And they have real jerky movements, like a bird. You know, their heads are just real jerky, not, nothing smooth. And they are, they've been seen quite a bit coming out in uh, Central South America at night to hunt. And they are carnivorous. They, millennia ago, they took over a lot of these crystal caves that I had discussed because of the importance it is to this mammalian group of uh, uh, genetic farmers. The 22 genetic experiments. And of course, the insectoids are extremely involved. Uh, most of the technology of the insectoids is not what we would call technology. They will genetically build out, genetically build ships, genetically build drones and workers to do, to do their bidding. And they, they use that type of technology more than they do what we consider technology. And of course, our local star cluster so is, a, is a host of these programs. And I already mentioned most of this, that these programs are in competition with each other. And they terraform, they bring different plants and animals from different planets, slightly modify them genetically for the new environments. So the programs are made up of these components. There's a genetic component, which I described where they, they tinker with our DNA to evolve us a few percent every 5,000 years. The consciousness component and the spiritual component are pretty, pretty related. But they need our consciousness to grow at the same time that they're uh, advancing our genetics. Now, of course, some of the competing programs are trying to suppress our consciousness and to interfere with the genetic program. And of course, the cosmic component is the most important. It's like a giant clock. They travel around from planet to planet as our solar system is rotating around the galaxy going like this around the galaxy. And every once in a while, we come through this one highly energetic, uh, like gaseous part of the, um, of the universe as we go through. And it was, there was a, a cl cluster of stars that exploded there and changed um, the energetics. So, and that is where these, a lot of these cosmic energies um, we're, we, we travel through them, and our, and our uh, solar system is revolving, and it's like a dynamo. As it goes through these energies, it's, it's friction. The friction is building up the energy. The energy goes around up into the north and south pole of the sun and comes out from the sun. That's how the sun actually works. It's, an electric, it's like a light bulb. Now... I think we've seen some, we're supposed to be in solar minimum, but we've seen some very interesting activity with the sun recently, have we not? And all of that is tied to the energetic weather that is occurring and the earthquakes.
These are all things that the Blue Avians told me that were going to happen, and I discussed six months ago in Cosmic Disclosure. And now we're watching it happen before us. We understand the concept of star seeds, you know, uh, ET souls incarnating here. Now, what's very bizarre is that a lot of people they think these this group of people is being abducted by non-terrestrials. Isn't that against cosmic law? Isn't that against their free will? Yes, it is. A way around this, the, the benevolent and malevolent, good and bad, uh, non-terrestrial races are very good at skirting or getting around these cosmic laws. And one of the ways they do that is they will incarnate here as us, forget who and what they are, and then agree to be a part of these experiments. I was first brought into the programs, I was involved in what they called the in, uh, intruder, intercept, and interrogation program. From our perspective, there was one group that had come in and abducted humans and returned them back to their previous location dead. And our military forces were like, these are evil beings, we need to find out what's going on. And eventually they were able to capture some of them. And it turned out, good and bad is perspective. These beings, thousands of years ago, had had a crew that crashed on our planet. And the beings in that ship got caught up in our incarnation cycle. So it was a rescue mission. And, and from their point of view, it was a rescue mission. From our point of view, humans were being killed. So how do we bridge that gap? That's very, very difficult if you think about it. And of course, it's the, the natural law loophole that they use by uh, reincarnating here as humans. Now, because they are, these 22 genetic programs are in competition, often they will abduct the experiments of another group to gather intel or to also try to pollute or to mess up the experiment of uh, the opposing group. Now, how is the experiment contained? Well, we are the zookeepers of our own, we're, we're our own prison keepers. They program us through speaking different languages to keep us separate. Different races were programmed through religions, social conditioning, not to interbreed with each other. It goes way back. You know, many remember in the Bible, uh, the Israelis were told to go in and kill everybody from the opposing races. Well, this, has, this goes back to the genetic experiments where they did not want any cross-contamination between experiments. And they used geographical locations, obviously, to separate them so they would not come together. But they've always divided, divided us. And of course, there's, they're, they're constantly at almost, not war, but conflict with each other with these experiments. And it's, a, a major, it's been a major struggle to keep their experiments pure, especially after this pre-Adamite group that once lived on Mars and Tiamat, they, after they, their, uh, the planet exploded, they moved to the moon and that was their base for a long time. And then um, they were attacked again and had to come down to Earth. And that was about 60,000 years ago. And they really started to mess up a lot of the genetic experiments that were going on. They went crazy uh, making chimera, mixing humans with animals, their DNA with humans, all of it. All of it. Now, the long-term program, all of the ETs out there were once experiments. They started off very uh, raw and rudimentary. Their genetics were enhanced. Their consciousness was enhanced and to a point to where they became self-managing. Now most of these groups determine when they need a genetic upgrade, when they need a change in consciousness. And they become, one of the steps is that you become an uh, interstellar species. Maybe a hundred years from now, time is relative, of course, with time with space travel. Somewhere at a local star, someone's going to sit down with an artist and describe an alien that abducted them. 
and it's going to look like you and me. We're going to be the ETs out there that are going to become a part of this uh, managing the experiment. Now, the upgrades in our genetics and consciousness are timed to coincide perfectly with this galactic cosmic change that occurs, with these energies that come in. That They work with the cosmos in this ascension machine that we live on. Now, as I discussed earlier, to reach success, self-management, there has to be a perfect balance struck in the DNA, genetic, and spiritual consciousness component as we're developing. And um, we've suffered a lot from competing programs coming in and uh, screwing around with our consciousness and our, our genetics. We should be much further along than we are. And before we can make it to the next level, we have to raise our consciousness or our vibration. We're seeing a lot of very strange solar activity even though this is supposed to be the solar minimum. What is occurring can appear scary to many, many people. The ancient mystery teachings have all prepared these elite secret societies with the information I'm telling you about now, that what they call is a solar sneeze, which is the, earth, the, the sun has a 360 degree full circumference mass coronal ejection. Just everything, all the surface of the earth expels, of the sun expels. And the entire sun becomes like a, a sunspot, dark. And for a certain amount of days, it will, the sun will appear dark. And then it pops up in equilibrium again. And uh, is back in balance before it goes through the cycle again. And the huge population, this ascension event that's occurring, many of the souls are here because they know it's the time and they're here to ride the wave of, of ascension. The solar sneeze is said to give more than 100,000 years of evolution in less than 1,000 years. Now, Bridget Nielsen, I think she's in here, coined a phrase recently that I love. We came here as star seeds, but now is the time that we become star blossoms. This is a time everyone, I've never seen star seeds so excited about their mission. All of us are blossoming and coming into our mission. And we're finding that all of our missions link together. Now, how many people think that um, the head of the UN is going to come up to a microphone and tell us aliens exist. Nobody. Not one hand went up. When we do get disclosure, full disclosure, it's not going to be a kumbaya moment. Everyone in this room is not going to hold hands and start singing and crying and being excited. It's going to be a traumatic, very traumatic moment for humanity. Because full disclosure it's not about are there ETs. It also encompasses all the information about the crimes against humanity that have been perpetrated on us to keep the secret, as well as information about this galactic slave trade where over a million people a year are taken off planet. At the age of 17, 16, almost 17, when I was completed with the MyLab training, I was what they called drafted into uh, the Navy's secret space program. I was taken to the Lunar Operation Command for processing. Even though I was under 17, they had me sign a bunch of documents, gave me medical exams. Um, all these injections, not, n nobody told me what they were. They just walked up, you know, gave you injections. You know, you were not entitled to know what they were. Now, I mentioned the jobs. They would take them, take them up to one of the um, interrogation stations and try to find out why they're here. What's their agenda? Because there is a process that these beings can come down and get approval to live amongst us and study us. And of course, 
uh, the Lunar Operation Command is basically air traffic control. When any type of craft comes into our solar system, they have to uh, provide a friend or foe signal. They, they, they have to uh, tell us their intent. Back before we had developed out our own space program, these groups were coming in, scooping up humans and leaving. And after we developed our own secret space program, we were able to repel these people, but of course the negative humans decided that uh, the slave trade was a good commodity, and they started trading off, like I said, a million humans off the planet every year for technologies and biological samples from other star systems. I already covered this. Now this is a recent representation of the vessel I was assigned to. The security, the military people, they did not want to be assigned to the research vessels. There was no action there. It's very boring. And they would, for a derogatory statement, they would call the ship a hot dog because it slightly uh, resembles in America a hot dog where they put uh, like a sausage in a bun. Solar Warden has gone through a few different names since the 90s. I don't know what the current name is, um, but uh, Solar Warden was the, the Navy's first uh, program name for uh, the secret space program. Now these vessels are basically submarines that have been fitted. Uh, in the beginning, they used submarines retrofitted with torsion field engines, and then they developed them out further to have um, eight fleets. And these ships are traveling to other solar systems and these vessels are dedicated to scientific research. Here are some other views. These are very uh, close representations. The name of my craft was the Arnold Sommerfeld. He was a German scientist that uh, was a theoretical physicist whose ideas really fed into a lot of the new quantum physics theories. The ship from the middle would come apart. All of the inside was modular. It would pull out. You could change it to a troop transport craft, to a hospital craft, a scientific research craft, whatever you needed by changing out modules inside the craft. Now, I worked mostly with what we call the eggheads. They were the scientists and the engineers. And they were very mundane activities. I was helping break down and set up rooms for experiments. I assisted in monitoring experiments. Um, uh, we, they did what, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the training. Redundancy training. We would have to train along with other people on the ship to get a general idea of their uh, of their duties so that we could perform them in in the time of an emergency and I because it was so boring it really was boring I spent a lot of time on the smart glass pads accessing the human database of information some of these cigar vessels were two kilometers long They were built both in Antarctica and in Utah, underground. There is a, a huge shipbuilding facility. Now, most of the engineers that I worked with stated that when the craft were about 60% completed, they moved in and lived on the craft for the rest of the build-out. And they assisted with the build-out and, and would know the ships intimately. For, for engineering. Now a smart glass pad, if you were to find one laying here on the ground, it would look like just a piece of plexiglass, unremarkable, with a little metal strip on the side, a little bit of wire, internal wiring, very, very small, barely able to see. And it had a historical, it had historical information 
on it that would be displayed, you neurologically interfaced with it. When it touched your fingertips, it would be clear. And once you learned how to activate it mentally, it would turn opaque or kind of white. And then you'd begin to start seeing data in whatever language was your native language, as well as not exactly holographic coming off the device, but very rich uh, three-dimensional um, uh, images and scenes. Have all of you heard of William Tompkins? Yeah, he recently passed on while um, actually on the day of the eclipse. Um, he actually pro was most likely involved in debriefing the German, uh, the spies that went to Germany to find out about their secret space program during World War II. A lot of the information he was able to gather was on the smart glass pads. Imagine me, I was looking at all this information on the smart glass pads, and then I get to meet the guy who was debriefing people who put the information in. It was very interesting. We had some very interesting conversations. There were a few more I, I would love to have had with him. This is when he was working for the um, one of the, I'm trying to remember, uh, was it Northrop Grumman? I can't remember which uh, of these uh, um, companies he was working for at the time, but they had him design a new type of naval spacecraft. And indeed, I ended up seeing these. They look very much like the stealth ships that the uh, United States is using today. These are flying over our heads at, the ver at this very moment. Very big, very big. Um, larger than aircraft carriers. The history of the secret space program. Now everyone knows that Nikola Tesla was way ahead of his time. He actually discovered the true model of the universe. It's an electroplasmic universe and also torsion. The whole universe is a giant torsion bubble. Upon his death, all of his information was removed from his safe, but very few people know that John G. Trump, President Trump's uncle, was the one who removed all of this information and studied it. So most likely Trump grew up hearing stories about free energy, and about space travel. Recently when Trump entered office, he signed a secret memorandum requiring that there are over 8,000 classified patents. He ordered a large number of them to be un declassified. Um, the Department of Energy is the main group that watches over these patents. And they told him it would take 10 years at least to get all, everything ready. And uh, he said, no, do it now, do it now. And there's pushback. They're not wanting to release the information for obvious reasons. Victor Schauberger was basically the, the father of torsion field physics here on, on our planet. He met Hitler in 1934, and then he was forced, just like most of the secret space program development, it, it, it's mostly been built out by slaves slave labor, and he became one. Now, Maria Orsic from the Vril Society, she was uh, doing experiments with her group. Now, they ended up getting in contact with more of a positive group that did not have the agenda of the Nazis. Admiral Byrd in Hi Operation High Jump in 1947 was sent down to Antarctica to locate and destroy the last remaining Nazis. We knew that they were down there. We knew that they were in Argentina. We knew that they were in, in the Ross Ice Shelf region of Antarctica. And we went there with our conventional weapons. We won World War II, supposedly, so we thought we were gonna take them out. And the official story was that we were testing um, cold weather um, um, machinery, how the machines acted in cold weather, how soldiers acted in cold weather, but it was actually a military 
um, invasive, ev invasive program. And of course, in 1952, the um, spacecraft that flew over Washington, those were manned by Germans. The Germans learned very quickly that the highest secret in the land was the existence of ETs. And it's not because they don't think we can handle that ETs are out there. That's BS. That's what they tell us. You can't handle the truth. The real reason is because they know that we'll start asking, how did they get here? And then they have to uh, release free energy. And of course, we know that that's how they control the planet. And they don't want to lose control. This is what the Lunar Operation Command looked like at the end of my time there. It originally was built into a swastika by the Germans, and then we built it out. Here's an animation. There was a protrusion in the middle of uh, the crater that was a hole that went down underneath, and only part of the base is above ground. The rest is underground, and it's built out in the shape of a bell. It gets wider and wider, and uh, there are, are at least 11 levels. I was not uh, granted access. And they have, uh, it's on the dark side of the moon at about the 10 o'clock position, and they use cloaking and shielding device, uh, devices to where if a satellite went over, it would just see a mirage. This is the dart, which would come in my backyard and pick me up. My wife, when I first started telling her about it, thought I was a little crazy. And uh, she used to smoke, and she would go out in the backyard, and she would see points to where three points of the craft had landed. And, you know, she could explain that off in her mind. But then she, one day she went out and found my bare footprints going out into the yard. You'll see in a minute, it's, it was mostly mud. It wasn't all grass. And then my feet footprints disappeared. And then they began again, like 10, 20 feet later, going back to the house. That's what really got her attention. This was my backyard at the time. And this is where they would fly in through the trees and land. Right here. There's my dog. Now they brought me up to the Lunar Operation Command, the first time I'd been there in decades. And like I said, it had built out. They brought me into a conference room that looked like any college, any university. And I was standing there and these two beings appeared behind me and the blue avians started using me to answer the questions for a full audience of military and civilian uh, government type people. Now, the Nazis and all of these military industrial complex groups formed what is called the interplanetary corporate conglomerate. There was an infrastructure in space built out that is huge. The reason they wanted to take over America was that we were building 10 tanks for every one of theirs. We had this huge industrial might. They needed that to build out the infrastructure of space, and they got it. A lot of you all have heard of the Hanabu, the spacecraft that the Germans had. Uh, the nickname for it was the honeybee. They, they called it the honeybee in the programs. And there were over a dozen different type of craft they had. The ICC secured places on the moon by using, um, I don't think it's fifth generation, a different type of tactical nukes that were basically vacuum. They, they would blow out and suck in, and most of the uh, damage was, uh, occurred in that way. And it was very similar to how they took over, um, you know, North South America um, during, you know, um, the discovery of America. But they did want to make sure that it, it is completely locked down on, on Mars. It's a major slave colony. They do not want a 13 colonies situation to occur, and they're preventing it. You know, there's no way that they can break away and become free like America supposedly did. In the portal systems, they can they, in the beginning, they could only transport raw materials, transport raw materials. And a lot of you have probably seen Stargate Atlantis or Stargate, to where there's a flat, uh, like, liquid kind of thing that they walk through in a circle. That's not how the portals work. The portals, they have 
devices, three or four devices on each side of the room. And in the middle of the room, a ball appears that looks like a, like a mirage above the road when it's hot. And it looks like it, the ground looks like it's being pushed down or warped. And you can enter it from 360 degrees around. People will walk in and they look like they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller as they go in. They would send like metal beams for building. The ball would open, the portal would open up in the middle of the metal beam and it would look like spaghetti. The beams would go bend and suck in. Here's the cosmic web. Each star, each galaxy is connected by an electromagnetic filament. Those are the traversable routes of wormholes. And of course, slave labor is used exclusively in building out these bases. The first bases were built out successfully in the 1950s. The Germans had a lot of difficulties um, in the area of Mars. They were building out bases at first. There were huge dust storms that caused major electrostatic discharges that was destroying all of their equipment. It was only within a region, a certain re region of the North and South Pole that they found that they, they could have the technologies before they were able to shield them that wouldn't be affected by these storms. And a lot of these people in the beginning came from the brain drain era and were brought in uh, to programs with big promises, sort of like what Laura Eisenhower, uh, they try to feed her, but she was wise enough to say no. Many were not. They were told, you will live like the Jetsons. And they showed them videos of underground bases here that the elite live in, and they said, this is how you're going to live. So people said, of course, I'll do this. But the reality is, this is how they ended up living. When they arrived, they were treated like cattle. Their, they were told their children would be um, trained in whatever job they wanted them to. They would be married off to whoever they thought would most be genetically compatible with them. They were prisoners. And of course, we are building on Mars craft that eat over 900 ETs are coming here to trade for. They are, if you see a UFO and an ET is in it, there's a good chance that humans built it for them. It sounds very strange, but we are very excellent engineers. That's one of the reasons that they uh, abduct us. And on Mars, uh, there were these different beings that were there. There was a humanoid race that had a slightly red skin and, and uh, almost black eyes, reptilians and um, insectoids. And the Nazis, they, uh, along with the crates they brought with them, they brought pests, cockroaches, rats, spiders, that because of the environment and the radiation, they grew to tremendous sizes. On the planet, there were already life. There were these giant burrowing worms that went underground, and there were these strange little uh, animals that were kind of like bats. So we couldn't understand how they flew, really, because the barometric pressure was so low. But every time their wings would flap, they would do a little peep, peep, peep as they would take off. And they lived in these bushes, in these uh, colonies of bushes. And of course, everyone's seen the signs of ancient civilization on Mars. This is nothing new. And the fact that on the surface of Mars, every day, water leaches onto the surface. It freezes. It thaws. There's plenty of water on Mars. This is a good representation of what the skies really look. This is more at dusk. The, they put red filters on, on NASA to make us think that everything's red. But at times the sky is red because of the, sun, uh, the dust, the huge uh, sandstorms. And there are aurora borealises that occur at times all over the planet, not just at the poles. And they're magnificent. And Buzz Aldrin recently spoke about the, uh, uh, the Phobos moon and the strange anomaly there. And this is going to be the part that I really wanted to talk about. I don't think we're going to have a whole lot of time. 
We have a Mayan group. Their technology is basically magic. Yeah, they, they're, they interface with stones with their consciousness. And they, they have craft that are made entirely out of stone. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to skip through this quickly. Now here are the raptors. I described them earlier. They're a remnant of the dinosaurs. They're very bird-like. Bird-like movements, I had covered this. Of course, the reptilians. There are, are many types of reptilians. Um, the reptoid ones are often mistaken for graves, and they claim to be the original inhabitants of our planet. The Draco Royals are white, 14 foot tall, very invasive in their communications telepathically, and they are uh, they control the joint underground bases. Ambassador Mika was someone I recently met. His planet had recently, in the last 300 years, uh, been liberated from the reptilians and had gone through their own ascension or consciousness renaissance process. And they're going to be here to assist us. We're going to be seeing a lot of these people. These are the Anshar, an inner earth group that we recently found. Um, they claim to have come here 17 million years ago. It turns out that they're from the future. They're us from the future. And uh, they had been monitoring some sort of strange Mandela effect sort of anomaly occurring. And they sent a small group back in time 17 million years ago to maintain their timeline. And that small group has turned into a huge civilization that lives underground over that 17 million years. This is Kari, the priestess, who I uh, interfaced with. She's over 130 years old. These people were also at the meeting, a very tall Asian-looking group who had crystals implanted under their foreheads, under the skin, and a very Indian-looking group that had, they didn't look quite that blue, but you know how the color of your vein under your skin they're, they're, all of their body was that color. And there was a, a very African-looking group that had these hourglass symbols that were present. They had a very powerful presence, very strong energy. And of course, the different Anshar, they have a race that is very pale, has white hair, and then they also have some of, of, that are a part of their race that have blonde hair and dark hair. This is one group that wears a silver star pendant, and they're very Mediterranean or Greek kind of looking. I was brought down to this location to where it was a, um, uh, a religious area for the Anshar. I had to go through a cleansing ceremony, um, met these people. I was brought to a meeting. This is a depiction of the meeting that all of the previous groups I showed were there. I was then brought into this large cavern to where their city is. And then I saw the city. There were saucers, cigars, an egg-shaped craft flying around at the top, and they were going through the walls. Take a look at this. This is very similar. all deep within the earth. They had an underground cavern that was basically a huge hydroponic system. The light, there was no source of light. When I asked where the light was coming from, she said it was produced by sound. And then they had a huge wildlife preserve with all types of prehistoric animals an obelisk in the middle, that above it had a huge ball, a plasma ball that fed light. Next, I was brought to the library. When I appeared in the library, there was a large golden arm coming down with a crystal ball in the hand, and then I was walked through the library. And I saw ancient manuscripts, 
and I saw books with ISBN numbers that looked like they were ordered online that they had. They had lost access to the crystal caverns because the raptors took it over, but they did have a huge crystal that they were trying to regenerate in some sort of a pressurized uh, container room. Of course, when I interfaced with Kari, we went hand to hand and we did a mind meld where we knew we found out everything about each other. And of course, my diet changed. I, when I first started shooting Cosmic Disclosure, I was 268 pounds and the diet changed. Now I'm 185. It happened very quickly. They walked me through an area where there were hundreds of Anshar in these floating egg type chairs and they were interfacing with us on the surface while we were meditating, while we were dreaming. And they were trying to give us information. And eventually they took me to Antarctica in one of their uh, the bus craft. It looks very much like a bus on the inside. And I, I was taken underwater to see these huge underwater caverns. The objects down there are submarines that are electromagnetically propelled that are the size of um, container ships. I actually saw them opened up in cranes emptying out containers. And recently in the news we've seen that this type of stuff does exist under the ice. Volcanism melts the ice and creates a very warm like 20 degrees Celsius area. This is very similar. They use geothermal energy and of course they were using steam to excavate a lot of the ruins that they were finding. Pressurized steam. And when I would enter and leave the uh, with the Anshar and craft, we would enter through this blue portal that was over the ocean. And I'm not going to have time to get into the Banish. They're a group of inner earth people that were cast out and live on the earth. Uh, I had a experience with one of them. It, they were very much, it was a succubus type of experience. Um, they uh, they seek uh, positions of power and they ha uh, actually have children with surface humans, which is very forbidden. After my experience with this woman who was uh, one of the banished, I was brought in and Kari told me that she had infected me with entity attachments and she used a long crystal that when she rubbed it, it started singing, kind of like when you rub your fingers on a glass with water in it. And she waved it above me and all the entities left. And then eventually they, this is when they took me to the, uh, the location to where there was a library, an ancient um, pre-Adamite library that they took us to. We took core samples off of these bodies. You know, it was not a very pleasant thing to, to get genetic information. And not far from us was an active excavation region where they were using pressurized steam to excavate the ice. And this is where we took core samples out of the bodies, the DNA samples. And they jokingly called it the Pompeii on ice, the way they found the bodies. It was very similar. And one of the things that I saw was a human being with a tail. Five, so part five of their genetic minutes, experience. Sorry, five minutes. Five minutes, okay. This is what the pre-Adamites look like with the elongated skulls. Very similar to what we've seen in Egypt. This is what they look like. Very weird uh, rib cages pushed in, pot bellies, and uh, all the men, they had like, kind of like a flabby chest, um, a lot of fat up here. Very similar to the depictions here. And of course, when I was with the Anshar, they completely walked through the wall to go into this library where they removed a number of scrolls. And recently the Anshar have told me that ET and contact from these beings, a lot of us are like, how come we're not getting contacted? How come no one's contacting me? Well, these beings, they have to approach us through our higher self. Our higher self determines if we get contact, what type of contact we will get. And it also tells them what they need to give us to prepare us for contact. And it all comes down through the higher self. 
It's very much different than the way I thought it was. And the Anshar have recently evacuated their city. All of the buildings, there's nothing but footprint now. They all went into this temporal anomaly very much like what I showed you earlier with the Federation base. And they're doing that as a uh, protective uh, reason because of these energies coming in. And of course, we've seen on the news exactly what I've been talking about for since February, about the areas under the ice that are 20 degrees Celsius. You could go with a t-shirt. You can go, in some of these places, you can go swimming. And the biggest secret is not, they want us to talk about these ancient civilizations. They do not want us talking about the research and development bases that they built during Project Iceworm during the 1960s. This is also how they built a lot of bases on other planets. I don't have time to show this whole video. Make a note to look for Project Iceworm on the internet and please watch that video. It'll give you a lot of insight on how these bases are built and maintained. And of course they have every story you've heard at Dulce about genetic, uh, engineering, about all these horrible slaves and stuff. All of that is going on in Antarctica. And it is against the treaty that was signed that stated it was for uh, peaceful purposes only. So this is the big thing that is the Achilles heel of the cabal. They do not want us talking about this, so I'm going to talk about it more. The Navy and the Air Force have competing programs. They're compartmentalized. They don't know about them. We've been seeded through movies and television about the existence of these programs subconsciously. This is what the bases, I mean, the uh, stations look like that the Air Force has that are about 500 miles above the surface of the Earth. They're serviced by these triangular craft that um, go up to them daily, dock, and then come back down. We also have a lot of smaller stations. The last minute, please. Okay, I'm going to wind it down. A lot of this was built during the uh, Star Wars SDI program of President Reagan. And what we want is not a partial disclosure, them giving us little bits for us to chew on. We want full disclosure. Like I said, it's going to be traumatic, but we deserve it. We need it to fully grow. There's too much being kept from us. Every legitimate ET contact that has occurred since the 1950s, they've basically said two things. Demand the release of suppressed technologies and raise your consciousness, become more spiritual. Well, that's, that's what all of our goals are. Now, we can put aside all of our different UFO belief systems, our UFO religions. We all have. We have to put those aside and work together to co-create a future with full disclosure. Only through uniting this community, community are we going to be able to do that. And recently, the Rothschilds tried to start a civil war in the ufology community that failed. So we need to come together and start to do protests, mass meditations, organize. We've got to do this. You can go to the fulldiscloseproject.org and join in. Form your own groups please, and together we're going to be able to navigate to the most optimal temporal reality. And our co-creative consciousness is what is going to do it. It's not going to be any outside force. The biggest thing the Blue Avians have told us, we don't need any more belief systems. We don't need any more religions. We need to get off of our knees, quit looking at the skies for salvation, and look inwardly because we are the ones that we've been waiting for. We've just been suppressed. And if you go to cosmiccocreation.com, I'm working with Gerald O'Donnell on a program to help us develop our meditative abilities and the mass consciousness. This is the book that I wrote, that I co-wrote with William Tompkins, Dr. Sala, and uh, Dr. Wood that should be released very soon.
they should have some very interesting information that they don't want us to put out. And of course, secretspaceprogram.com we recently obtained. This is one place where we can all come together and begin to organize. And of course, if you want to watch Cosmic Disclosure, you go to blueavians.com. You can watch it for free, as I stated before. And uh, that's the end. Gaia is hiring. They, look, they need a lot of these types of um, uh, skills. If you feel like you're called to uh, use your skills for this cause, you can do it with Gaia. You can do it with your own group. You can work together with us, but it's, it's time that we come together. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you very much.